I think we can start. Okay. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the very special talk in our webinar series in this autumn equinox today. This webinar is being streamed live on YouTube. You can find the link on our website or access it on our YouTube channel, Linear and CPI. Today we have the pleasure of having Dr. Mario Yurik, uh, Associate Professor of Astronomy and the Director of the Institute for Data Intensive Research in Astronomy and Cosmology, the Direct Institute at the University of Washington. Dr. Yurich's research focuses on computational and data analysis aspects of astronomy, astrophysics, and science in general, also, he's interested in methods and software that enable the use of large scientific data sets to solve experimental and theoretical problems. In astrophysics, he studies the solar system and other galaxies in Milky Way. Dr. Urich, Dr. thank you very much for being so kind and having accepted to give us this webinar today. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for, for having me here in, in Rio. It's always, always fun to, to visit, and especially when it's um, Winter uh, in the uh, in the northern hemisphere. I mean, coming down here with thirty degrees Celsius weather is is a is a delightful change. Um, so I'll uh, my, my my main topic today is going to be um, about um, data intensive tools or tools for data intensive astronomy. Um, and I've, I've set up that talk to hopefully not be too long and give a lot of uh, time for questions. So please do interrupt me and stop me and ask questions. I think that the, the point here is to, to have a conversation rather than, than me to pontificate for a long time. Um, but before I do that, I thought I'd, I'd show you a couple of slides about where I come from and the, the Rack Institute, uh, because I think there are, there are lots of similarities in both scientific interests that we have and in technological interests. And I would love for our groups to, to collaborate uh, as, as much as possible. Um, so what is DIRAC? Uh, DIRAC stands for Data Intensive Research in Astrophysics and Cosmology. Uh, for I, I'm sure most of you, those of you who are physicists know that the old DIRAC is also one of the famous, uh, one of the most famous physicists of the, uh, the 20th century. And he was infamous for never ever wanting to have anything to do with data or experiments. So our, uh, our founding director, Andy Connolly, who came up with the acronym has a sense of humor. Um, Dirac is an interdisciplinary institute at the University of Washington. Uh, we're based in Seattle uh, in the United States. Our, our goal is to uh, advance and support research with complex or large astronomical data sets. So if it's large enough to, to not be done on a laptop, we're interested in it. Um, we started in 2017. Uh, this was a continuation of UW's involvement in Lubin uh, and before that analysis in, uh, in SDSS. We've got um, um, six faculty members. We, we the institute numbers over 40 people. It's about um, 25 or so research staff and faculty and postdocs. And then there are also uh, numerous graduate students. Um, and it's really built a, for collaboration. It's a place to visit if one is interested at, at UW uh, um, or, or working with survey data sets in astronomy, complex problems, inference, uh, ML, and, and so on. Um, scientifically, uh, there are a number of active areas. Um, 
we worked a lot on the solar system, uh, worked a lot on time domain astronomy. I'll show you some examples in a second. There's a, there's a lot of work on cosmology, um, um, both um, I'm using supernovae as tracers, as well as photo Z determination. Uh, Milky Way structure is something um, I do and Jelko Ivizic uh, does. Uh, then when we move more towards the technology side of the spectrum, we do a lot of inf inference and machine learning research. Um, we work, do a lot of research in astronomical software, so with producing useful codes and, um, and understanding how to successfully write software and build teams. And then the biggest project by far that we have is uh, both constructing and, and partnering and operating the Rubin Observatory. All of these here are driven by what our researchers find interesting. So these things change from, from year to year. Um, and the, the, other, the other way how we um, pick areas is we try to find areas that are just ready to where you know, an involvement at the level of our group can really make a big difference. And there are a number of areas, especially in technology today, that are kind of at this tipping point where if you tip it in the right direction, you can make the big difference for astronomy. And that's the kind of thing that our institute likes, uh, likes to do. Um, Here's a quick sample of what we've been, what we've been up to. Um, we got inner solar system research. So Sarah Greenstreet is uh, is at UW. She's um, um, worked on on numerous things, including predicting um, in models for any of these population distributions, um, including predicting that we should find um, a, a likely Venus crosser, and we we did. Uh, we're using ZTF. ZTF found one, and then this is. Sarah and then a quote she gave for National Geographic about that. We do, uh, we had a really nice um, a PhD thesis by Joachim Moritz, one of our graduate students, uh, building a new way to discover asteroids, a new algorithm that doesn't require more than one observation each night. Um, so you can give Joachim five observations within a month, um, distributed in any way, um, and he'll find the asteroids. Uh, so this was done on Google Cloud. Uh, we got a nice shout, shout out and which in collaboration with the B612 Foundation who funded this research and uh, Google CEO um, sent a tweet, which is kind of the high point of our year. Um, and then moving on, uh, we care a lot about satellite constellations because we've just spent two decades building the LSST. We'd love to actually be able to observe uh, things beyond near Earth orbit. Um, so um, Meredith Rolls and Dina Batishevich, one of our grad students and the research scientists are, are working um, with NAR Labs uh, um, Center for um, um, uh, Dark and Quiet Sky to understand how these satellites, whether they're a problem or not. Um, so there's a lot of work about that. I think, I think for, for Ruben, what, where I'm starting to land on this, for Ruben, I think we'll be fine. Uh, I think it's more of a question of how do we make sure this industry is communicating to us as astronomers and gets regulated sufficiently so that when the next company beyond SpaceX comes up with an idea to launch, let's say 200,000 really bright objects, that there are some channels or regulations in place so that in 2040s, we don't get surprised uh, with something much, much, much worse than, than Starlink. Um, Lots of work on transits in time domain astronomy, uh, especially with ZTF. Uh, we're a partner on, on ZTF-1, um, and Eric Bellum continues to work with ZTF-2, um, discovering all kinds of weird and strange objects um, as a precursor for Rubin. Um, and then we uh, also have Jim Davenport, who's working on, on um, both variable stars and a number of other things, but the thing that I point out here are techno signatures. So, um, Ruben is going to be um, a, a huge source of data on what's twinkling in the universe. Like, can you actually go in and, and try to discover and try to see if there's something that's inconsistent with what we would assume would happen with just natural physical processes? Um, why not? It's a, it's a high, uh, high risk, high reward uh, type, of, type of thing. And going back to the solar system, uh, Pedro Bernardinelli, um, who I think he did, he did his uh, undergrad at Sao Paulo. So I, I apologize. I guess he should have done it here. I understand there's some rivalry between the two. Sure, sure. No. <laughs> uh, 
But Pedro is a postdoc now with us. Before that, he was with Gary uh, Bernstein at um, uh, at UPenn, worked on on DES, uh, discovered the whole slew of TNOs in DES, and one of the things that that Pedro and Gary discovered was what's now the largest uh, observed comet in in the solar system. And Pedro, uh, with a number of our uh, other students, um, uh, is working on on detecting the next few thousand of Kuiper Belt objects in a survey called DEEP that we have running on DECCAM, but where um, day trilling is, uh, is the PI. Um, and it's a collaboration between us, uh, NAU and uh, University of Michigan. Uh, but the, the really big prize that we're all after is Ruben. Uh, when, when Ruben turns on, um, the kinds of things that we're doing with DEEP uh, that, that take us 46 nights, I think we're, we'll be able to do essentially in a night or two. Um, so it will be fantastic. Then there's supernovae. Um, and uh, I didn't mean to jump over supernovae uh, because they're not interesting, it's just because I know very little about them. Uh, but, um, and then there's there's more on the technology side of the spectrum. Um, so here I'm showing the, the link uh, Jupiter Hub, and I'll tell you more about it in my talk. Uh, we work on all this science that I just showed you. And as we work on it, we discover problems and annoyances. But as opposed to most other places, um, uh, folks like us and, and you here, we actually can do something about it. And we can go, all right, I'm annoyed by how this works in Jupiter. I'm going to go and fix it, or I'm going to find a way to fix it. And, and this motivates things like, like um, Jupiter Hub for Science Collaboration that we built with a whole lot of new interesting experiments. Um, and and the work that I'm, that I'm going to talk about in the in this in this main talk, um, but that's that's roughly kind of what what the rack is. Uh, we do a lot of um, undergraduate student research as well, um, and uh, building the Rubin Observatory is the, the most interesting um, or the biggest project right now. Um, it, it has its upsides. We're going to get Rubin. It has its downsides. Rubin took our uh, uh, one of our professors, Joe Blavis, which is now the director, which means we would almost never get to see him. Uh, but on the bright side, here's the observatory. I was there just four or five days ago in Chile, uh, and I can guarantee that this is not a uh, a rendering or a deep fake. It uh, it actually exists. Uh, it's it's fantastic, and it'll be on the sky. In, uh, in about a year, we're going to get the first photons. All right, so um, this is where to find us if you're at UW. These slides were originally um, uh, made for, for one of our internal uh, meetings, but I hope that gives you an idea of, of uh, where I come from and, and what is it that we do. So now with that, I'm going to go and switch to <coughs> Uh, to talk about, yeah. Okay. So now I'll, I'll switch to talking about um, what the what the topic is, which is. I named this Solutions for an Astronomy-Friendly Cloud because I gave this, this kind of talk at, um, at a session um, um, at, at the American Astronomical Society meeting a couple of months ago uh, on, on astronomy in the cloud. But what this really is, is, is more about that subtitle. Um, how do you let anyone who has the astronomical knowledge work with large data sets the, the way we they would work with, with fairly small data sets today. So, because right now, if you want to work with a large data set, you need to be an astronomer to, to, to understand what questions to ask. But you effectively also have to be a data engineer and, and a data scientist and a soft, semi-software engineer and a half of an IT person to, to be able to, to build a code to go through tens of terabytes of data to do it. And there are very few people like that. And that makes me worry. That makes many of us worried because we've just spent 20 years of our lives building Rubin and, and a billion dollars. Um, and it would be really sad if we build this huge data set and then only a few select 
people were able to use it. Um, it would just be, there's so much science in this data set that we need to make it possible to, to be used as broadly as possible. Um, so you, you'll see a, a, a long list of people here as my co-authors um, and Steven Stetzer is a, is a graduate student working with me. Uh, he's built a lot of this software. Uh, Sam Wyatt is a, is a postdoc who started uh, working with me about a year ago. Um, <clears throat> he's doing a lot of work on LSDB. And this, uh, Melissa and, and Max um, are, are from a new program called LINK. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about what, uh, what LINK is um, in, in a second. So this kind of scary future in which we, we build the Rubin, but only a few of us know how to use the data or are able to use the data uh, is, is what triggered us to, to try to put together a program, a group uh, of scientists and software engineers that will identify um, biggest bottlenecks and biggest issues, biggest obstacles standing between what Ruben is going to build, deliver and your typical astronomer being able to use that. Um, and so it's a, it's a program um, whose goal is to collaboratively develop open computing systems and algorithms needed for large survey analysis. So it's, it's in essence, Let's make this easier. Um, and it's, uh, it's based at University of Washington at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, this is one team spread over two locations. We have about half a dozen software engineers at UW and half a dozen software engineers uh, at, um, at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, it's being funded by the Schmidt Futures Foundation. Um, Eric Schmidt is the former CEO of Google. Um, he's been interested in, in science and astronomy and how to make science, scientific software more efficient for quite a while now. Uh, and it, uh, this program lasts for five years. So the, the theory here is, you know, how we usually develop software in astronomy is um, we get a postdoc and we Google and we learn how to do something and then we hack something together and then we use this ball of yarn to produce a, a paper and then Full spaghetti, I guess. We produce a paper and then we throw it on GitHub, and and there's our software. Um, it takes longer. It's not as high quality, um, and typically it's not very sustainable. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to basically pretend we're a, we're a small software startup, and we're going to we went and hired software engineers. Um, <clears throat> we've identified problems that we need to solve that have kind of the biggest um, addressable market, if you will. Um, and then we're, we're un unleashing these software engineers to basically say, then go do what you would do when you work back in Google. Um, and uh, let's see if this will actually get, get us faster to, to code, get us faster to results. Um, because um, it's, it's, it's one of these things that's all mysterious to me in, in, in Astro. Um, you know, if you have a medical problem, you don't go reading through the medical encyclopedia thinking you're going to go and cure yourself, you go to the doctor. Um, it's more efficient and safer. Yet somehow when we have a software problem, we think I mean, physicists are awful. I mean, I'm one of them. We think we can solve everything. And, and, and this is a, a, an attempt to see if we can actually do this better if we collaborate with those who are actually trained to do this. Um, okay, so uh, motivation. We're, we're entering the age of data set driven astronomy. Um, I love this plot because it shows um, the footprints of, of um, upcoming and existing surveys. <clears throat> so we started with a tiny little thing called SDSS over there. It took um, 10 years to image some 15,000 square degrees of the sky. Um, and then this slightly thicker thing here in the center called LSST, we'll do that in about three day, three nights and we'll go four magnitudes deeper. Um, so that's progress over about 20 years. Um, how did we deal with these data? Um, this is a uh, simplified model of what an astronomical archive looks like today. <clears throat> you usually, we, we, we take these surveys, we process the data and we stick them into astronomical archives and then users use them from there. Um, Typically, the archive has some kind of web front end that is the interface to the user. And on the back end are either, either um, databases, um, relational databases typically, and file systems. So in case of Sloan, 
Um, it's it's um, cast jobs for and and SQL Server for the relational database and that that uh, infamous um, list of directories that the, the data access server DAS for uh, if you want files. Um, and then the user, they essentially use this as a silo where data lives. Uh, they, they come to the front and they either pull some subset of files or pull some subset of rows from the database by running queries. But then the actual analysis is not done in the archive. It's done at some analysis resource that the user has access to. It's usually their laptop, um, or in some cases, it's their cluster <clears throat> on in, in their local university. But it's the key point is that it's outside of the archive. And this paradigm is something I'm calling the, the, the subset download analyze pattern. So you take a subset, you download the subset, and you analyze it. And we keep doing that over and over again until we're ready to start the paper. Um, this is about to break down. Uh, here's where we are with ZTF. We've got about a trillion detections, a billion sources. These are all orders of magnitude. I think ZTF is now up to two or three billion sources. Um, not the alert, alert rates and so on. It's still possible to do this kind of thing with ZTF. But with LSST, um, all of this goes up by another order of magnitude. So, so the issue is that first step, which is subset, take a subset of the data set, that small subset, quote unquote, say with Ruben, if you took 0.1% of all the data, that's still a terabyte. So imagine how long it takes to download that terabyte to then go do something. And then imagine if you need to iterate and download the new terabyte because now you've adjusted your query, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that is, is not ideal. That would present a huge obstacle to science. Now, all these numbers are going up in terms of data, but the thing that remains constant is the size of analysis codes. Analysis codes, <clears throat> I actually did derive this number by going looking through my previous papers and looking at all these awful things I wrote, like super Mongo scripts. And most of you don't even know what that is, and that's good. Um, well, why do you want I actually, I still love super Mongo. So Robert, if you're watching this, I'm, I like your super Mongo. Oh, uh, I'm from John Tony's. Uh, <laughs> oh, so you're from Mongo. Okay. Mongo. Uh, but the, the point is the the data sets are getting larger, but our analysis code, uh, which if you think about what our analysis code is, it's, it's really a projection of, of how smart we are. So our analysis code is, is remain, remains roughly at the same size. For a typical paper, it's an order of 50 kilobytes that you write. Um, so instead of, like the solution is obvious, right? Instead of downloading the data to, to, to put it on the separate analysis resource when you're going to run your analysis code, why don't we do something like this? We put the analysis resource next to the data, and then you upload your code to next to the data and have it run next to the data. And <clears throat> this is something that has been talked about for decades you know, while I was in, in you know, probably in elementary school. Uh, but but for, for Ruben is, I think, um, in, only in, in 2010s, this has really started hitting um, the um, um, mainstream slash experiment, the real, real science usage with um, uh, work like um, um, uh, the work of Dallas Hopkins that um, um, uh, Alex Zalay did and with work that, that you've done here with, um, uh, with the ZTS, uh, with the DES portal. And when, when we looked uh, at Ruben, how are we going to provide our computing capacity to the users? We decided like this is this is definitely the way to go. Um, and and we've come up with this um, architecture and and given it a main science platform. So the idea here, and I'm, I'm probably telling you everything that you already know, is you've got the user who is accessing the 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 archive again through a web browser, but through web front ends that are rich. So that means it's not just there with a form to download data or with a form to write a query, but there's an actual rich portal that you can use to explore the data set. And there's a web front end that like Jupyter Notebooks that you can use to, to do the analysis right there rather than at your, um, uh, at your analysis resource. 
And one of the things that this requires is now, instead of having your local analysis resource, you have to have that analysis resource next to where the data is. So you've solved one problem, which is how do I get subsets of the data? And the answer is you don't, you upload the code next to the data. But you've kind of created another problem because now you have to have that analysis resource next to the data. And everyone who wants to work with this data set, there should be room for them, right? Like they're how do we how do we um, um, make it possible for them to uh, have basically enough cores? So this is the first issue I list here. Um, most current science platforms and deployments assume dedicated on-premise and user compute resources, and and that's a bit of a problem if you think about it. One is you have to buy those computers. Computers, so that's a large upfront capital investment. That's millions of dollars that you have to pay before you get even the first user potentially. Um, limited elasticity. It means that you know on a on a typical day you may have two or three users, and then um, two weeks before the annual Brazilian Astronomical Society meeting, you suddenly notice that there's 50 people trying to get their finish their posters and finish their data. Uh, and depending on how you size your cluster. You cannot scale to that level, or if you size it to be to be too big, you're basically wasting all that capacity for, for the rest of the year. Um, how much do you give each user uh, in Ruben? It, it turns out it's going to be fairly small. It's going to be an order of tens of cores, an order of one terabyte per user, and and the science would really benefit from large data sets. Um, you got limited variety of types of computing nodes. Uh, things are changing extremely rapidly. Three years ago, nobody really cared. Well. Fewer people cared about GPUs, especially in astronomy than today. But today, if you want to do anything machine learning related or even just use something off the shelf, you'd want to know the GPUs. So if you purchase, if you designed your system five years ago and put in a purchase order three years ago and the computing arrived two years ago, you're out of date. Uh, so that's one of the problems. The, the other problem is um, we're all going to do something like, like this, but the data are still we moved the analysis resource here, but the data are still in the database backend, um, and that relational database backend is is fundamentally it can be parallel at some level, but fundamentally isn't. So that means I have a Ruben database that may have by the end thirty trillion rows of observations, um, and I write a query, and the results of that query are coming through me from a single node. Uh, that query might execute on, on 20, 30 nodes in the back end, but they all come through a single node as the result. So if I want to now do some processing, then I have to spread them back out of that single node. It's a single point, it's a single chunk point that that is um, not, it's gonna be a big bottleneck for, for a large data set analysis. And one way to avoid it is you can write really clever SQL queries so that you, you push your science analysis into the SQL query and let the database execute that. But A, not even you know, DBAs know how to do that. Uh, it's extreme. like if you've seen some of these queries with subqueries and so on, it's extremely complicated. No astronomer knows how to do it. And, and, and second, uh, there's actually not enough compute to do it because these databases are not sized to do that. Those nodes are sized for regular queries, and all the the actual compute power is on the other side of that node. So it's it's a it's it's not ideal. And the the biggest problem, from my perspective, is um, we all think about Ruben as the next big thing coming, but it's it's not the only next big thing coming. There's going to be Euclid. There's going to be Roman. Uh, there are going to be numerous what we would call smaller surveys like ZTF, but that observe at much higher cadence and are generating significant amount of data. Uh, <clears throat> the kinds of things you would like to do is, for example, take Ruben data and then combine it, cross-match it, join it with things that come off of Roman, off of Euclid, um, historical data from BES, from SDSS. And that means um, you want to bring those data, data sets together somehow. Yet, even though we have this kind of an architecture, this is not everything in one place. Like this is what it looks like for Ruben, and for Ruben, it's going to be at at, at Stanford at Slack. Uh, for for W first uh, Roman, it's going to be at uh, in Baltimore. Uh, for you know other uh, for like ZTF and Euclid in the US is going to be in Pasadena. So these are things now 
in all of their separate silos. So if you want to start joining these data sets, you're back to square one. You have to figure out how to pull them all out together. You cannot use those resources. And it's it's um, it, it's not ideal. I think that's, that's something we're the biggest issue with, with where we're going right now. Um, okay, so clearly I have a solution to pebble. Um, so this is these kinds of issues are what made us start thinking about can we use uh, like what does the industry do? Can we use solutions that industry does? And in this case, it's it's basically the cloud. Um, so we came up with this concept called the astronomy data commons. And the idea is rather than each one of us building our own data center in, in the basement of our center, um, why don't we outsource the hardware and data storage to, to a cloud facility um, and upload data sets there? So we shift the frequently used stuff into the cloud. Uh, there are multiple benefits. You leverage existing storage infrastructure. Um, Cloud storage is an amazing piece of work. We all complain about how expensive it is. It's $23 per month per terabyte to store a terabyte on AWS S3. And you may go, wow, but for that money, you know, for $200, I could buy a, a 12 terabyte hard drive and run it for three, for three years. So $23 seems insane for a terabyte per month. However, what, what we can keep missing is we're not actually paying for the one terabyte of storage. What we're paying for is effectively infinite bandwidth because that one hard drive has 200 megabytes per second of bandwidth. That one terabyte of bucket storage has any bandwidth you need. You can unleash a thousand cores to go hit that one bucket and each core will get a few hundred megabytes per second. That's what you're paying for. So that means you can actually not only have a, a hundreds of terabytes in the cloud, you can go through 100 terabytes in minutes if you needed to. So that's why this is so. That's why this appears costly. But when you when you take into account the time to do the computation, it actually turns out to be doable. I'm not going to say reasonable. I think it should be cheaper. Um, the other thing that you you can do is now you don't have to worry about which node types to to purchase because the the cloud companies keep rolling out new nodes all the time. So. GPUs become a thing, you can just use GPUs. Um, TPUs become a thing if they ever do. You can just go ahead and use them. And so we benefit from all of this, and this is why industry uses this thing. But there are <clears throat> there are more things that we can do. And this is now leading into my my, my um, the, the rest of my talk. Um, suddenly, if we do something like this, we have all our data sets in the cloud. And the next thing that we should do is try to make them interoperable. So let's export them in a standardized queryable high performance formats. Uh, we, uh, and, and let's use formats that are industry standards. So things like Parquet. And I'll talk about this in a second, but if we do it this way, we start enabling tools that work say on Ruben to then at the same time work on ZTF or LSST or, or any of the other things that, that we have in the cloud. And if we build an industry standard, we don't need to write those tools ourselves. But we may need to just write a small astronomy layer on top of existing tools. It's no different than you know, if I told you, let's go write a, a relational database. You would tell me, no, we'll just download Postgres. Okay. So, so why do we, why won't we do that for other things in astronomy? There are like many of these large scale data and, and analytics tools right now that exist. We should just go ahead and use them like Spark, um, uh, like, like other frameworks. Um, so we export things in, 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 uh, uh, in queryable high performance formats, and then we adopt standard APIs and analytics tools. Um, so the kinds of things we do today with tabular data sets is we usually put them into a relational database and then we put tab on top, the, the table access protocol. Um, tab has been written um, many years ago for, for an age where we've had these kinds of silos that, that I just explained where half of the data lives in Baltimore, half of the data lives elsewhere, and we just get data through this one tiny connection in the center um, or tiny, this one thin pipe really. And it's not been designed to support to access to the entire data set. It's designed to give you, you know, your subset of maybe 10 rows or a million rows, but not 10 trillion rows. Uh, so I'm arguing that 
that was a great idea for its time. And I think we're still going to use it in certain areas. But here, the industry has solved the problem for us because um, they've gone one layer below. Um, and S3 APIs are the de facto standard today for accessing large data sets in Amazon and in other clouds. Um, we, rather than, than, than building our own protocols on top of all this stuff, we use industry standard formats like Parquet, we put them into S3 buckets, we use S3 APIs to access them, and then we use tools that are readily made there and, and use an industry like Spark, like Ray, like Desk to just do that. That entire stack effectively gets written for us. We don't have to, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, and we leverage these massive investments in data analysis um, that the industry has done. Um, I, I bet you that the combination of Facebook, um, uh, Google, um, and, and Amazon have a lot more engineers and money than all of us do combined. And they'll come up with, with solutions that, that we can just adopt. Um, and this also opens up industry academia collaboration opportunities. So it goes in two ways. One, um, astronomy is of interest to in the industry as, as we can serve as a good test case for some of their and their big data solutions. Um, if we start doing our things on our own, we we don't we have no reason to communicate ever. Um, if we start using industry standard tools, we can we have something to talk about and, and gather over. Um, and the opposite is is the other direction. We in universities educate students. Most of my students who are astronomy undergraduates are not going to be astronomers when they quote unquote grow up, graduate. Um, they will go to the tech industry. If I teach them this whole stack of uh, obscure astronomy tools, they're not competitive. If I teach them this stuff, they can get a really good job right after they, they, they finish their, their undergrad degree and, and discover just how poorly paid an astronomy uh, graduate student is. Um, so, so this is, I think, a, a sticking close, as close to the industry as possible, I think is important. Um, and then the nice thing is now that you have these data sets in the cloud and they're all in standard formats and you can access them through S3, you can build science platforms on top of that. Um, and you can build not just one, but you can build multiple. And because all of these platforms have access to the same underlying data lake, um, I can build a you know, Lubin science platform that has access to Lubin um, that will be the best place to go if you want to work with Rubin data, because we're going to develop all kinds of tools that, that are really suitable for Rubin and we need to understand what our users want and so on and so on. But that same platform can access Roman, can access ETF, can access DES, and so on. So if my user, who's primarily interested in Rubin, needs to pull in some of these other data, effectively they're there. And so they're able to do it without thinking about staging, without thinking about all, all this other mess. Uh, and the same thing can then be done by Ursa for um, you know, Euclid or by MAST for Rubin from different perspectives. And we can offer different ways to access these data sets. And depending on um, what you as a user want, you may go to one or the other, or, or the third or the fourth. Or actually, um, I can get annoyed by all of these because let's say I care about the solar system and none of these big guys care about the solar system because everybody wants to find out what dark energy is and get a Nobel Prize there. And where they, what they don't realize is that the real Nobel Prize is if you find planet nine. Uh, so I go and, and I say, this is very annoying. They don't, they aren't giving me any tools. So I'm going to go write my own tool that I can deploy because all of this lives in the public cloud. I don't have to ask anyone for permission because I have access to all these data sets. I just need to find someone who's going to think that I'm not that great that I'm not crazy and who's going to fund my, my work in the cloud. Um, and that's what we have grants for. Um, so I'm going to get maybe you know, a couple of hundred thousand uh, to set up my, my own personal science platform in the cloud and that, that will that specialize for, for a certain thing. Uh, and, and I can easily do that and don't have to spend a year figuring out how I'm going to pull the data to my local data center, et cetera, et cetera. It speeds up research a lot. Um, Okay, so this is the, the vision that, that we're all kind of working towards. And I, I just want to say one thing, which is here I have the, the, the public cloud, uh, which in the US means say, Amazon or Google or Microsoft uh, in mind, 
But you can also imagine you know, something like what Europe is doing, and they're 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 building their own academic cloud. Um, but maybe something that that Brazil may do at some point. You know, you have all the institutions in Brazil that go beyond astronomy. You basically, have a cloud for all of science. Um, it doesn't matter. There are many ways to solve this. The key point here is that you outsource this hardware and data storage to someone else who will hopefully do it better than you can. And, and that effectively makes these data sets appear nearby uh, from the point of view of users using these APIs. That's really the key point. So it could even be on-premise. Uh, Canada has their, uh, what's called, CanFAR network. Um, and, and they have an academic cloud that that they have uh, their data sets in, and it, it looks just like UK just like this. Yeah, UK too. Um, so don't if you don't like the idea of a commercial cloud, don't don't worry. This this is applicable to uh, other solutions. So we took a look at this thing and and thought to ourselves, all right, what's missing to demonstrate this and to build this? Because what we wanted to do in in, in direct is we're specialized in. Kind of trying to figure out how things could look 10 years from now and then identify the key pain points what are the pieces of software they're missing and then try to develop those pieces of software and demonstrate that this can work and then we partner with a data center or you know, someone who's actually going to deploy this to the user because we don't we're not a data center we don't support hundreds of users we don't have that experience and, and that that scale but what we can do is we can provide you with software you know, we're, we're kind of like Weapons dealers appeal um, to everyone who wants to use it. That's a terrible. Um, yeah. I'm not going to say that. Um, we are recording. Record, don't forget. I know it's time for me to get canceled. Um, all right. So, so the three things we we found missing are one, the formats, um, and this is urgent because if we want this to live, the 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 big dog here is going to be LSST. And if LSST puts out, and LSST is going to be in the cloud, we just signed a contract with Google for three years of operations, LSST data are going to be served from the cloud. So extended yeah. contract. Yeah. So it's not just intermediate, um, this intermediate data, data facility. Um, and so if, if we do this, uh, then if LSST does this, then people will follow. So the key thing LSST is trying, needs, to, needs to somehow expose this data in the cloud, how to expose it, what kind of format do you put it into? And that's why I think that the format question is urgent. Let's come up with a decent format that LSST can use that can then enable this. Then the second thing is you have the format and now on top of the format, you, you actually want to use it for something. You want to do analyses and you want to show that a lot of science gets done. So you need some tools to, to work on top, of, uh, on top of those formats. And so we decided, we, so we, we, we need to build those to show that that, that works. And I'll talk a little bit about well, a little bit about one thing we we, we built um, started some three four years ago called uh, Apache extensions, astronomy extensions for Spark, and then a new thing called LSDB, and then the the third thing is our science platforms, and and this is specific to to public cloud, and then but also specific to I think private clouds that that, that people can build, and the, the the issue there is that clouds cost a lot of money. Uh, and uh, especially things like running Jupyter in the cloud costs, if you want to make the user experience good, it will cost you a lot more than if you had hardware at home. If, if you want to, but if you want to, to, to make it not cost you much, it's going to be a terrible user experience. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what, what we've done there. We, I think we've made, we found a way to, to solve both. So let's talk about formats. Um, I'll tell you about something called HipScout that we developed. And the, the motivation here is analysis on whole data sets, on entire data sets. And when I say entire data set, don't necessarily mean 100%. 10% is order of entire data set, or 10.1% technically. Um, so um, it's, it's when it's large enough to for the, the database for that single bottleneck through which all the data are coming from the database uh, becomes becomes too too narrow. Um, so we know that people want to, to run on all of Ruben data sets. Uh, I don't have to explain that to you because you just showed, showed me three use cases on DES where you're doing exactly that. So think those kinds of cases, but not Ruben. 
you're not going to run that on the database, you want to run that off of files. This is how the industry is doing it as well. So what you'd like to do is you also wouldn't want to store that into a single file. You want to partition it somehow so that you enable tools to operate in parallel and then you can, you can allow multiple, uh, potentially thousands of cores to, to, to run in parallel on your, uh, on your data set. And we have in Ruben um, like this, this wedge here in our sizing model. This is for parquet files. Uh, see catalog databases and then lots and lots of extra parquet tables uh, to enable this kind of file-based operation and to enable bulk download. So in theory, um, accessing these files is as simple as you know, running pandas read parquet uh, for on a standard partition. Now, how do you partition? Partitioning is key. And historically, we haven't really given this much thought. I, I went and looked at a couple of surveys, you know, Gaia, I'm still mystified how Gaia does the CSV generation because there's clearly hill picks underneath, but, but if you plot individual CSVs, they're not even in the same part of the sky. There's like hill picks from here and hill picks from there. And, and so I don't get it. Um, SDSS did um, individual runs, uh, one run per, per file. Um, ZTF did individual nights. Um, the, the other part of ZTF did, did tiles in the sky, but there's, there's no standard. So what that means is if I want to take a piece of Gaia to combine it with a piece of ZTF, I'm in trouble. I basically have to download both of them and reformat somehow. Um, so what would we like to do if we were to partition, if we wanted to partition these, these data sets um, in a more uh, uh, organized way? Um, you would like to partition the data set so that you keep all data related to the same object together. And in, in this case, it mainly means the entire time series. So if I have a, one of the things we've seen is very few users ask for, um, give me all the observations for this type. Most users ask for, for this area or this set of objects, give me all the observations that you have, because I'm going to take that time series and do something interesting with the time series. So I think you want all of those data to sit together by default on disk so you can enable that to be really quick. Um, second thing, you want to pick the partition spatially because most of our queries are spatial and fundamentally working uh, with, with a spatial data set. So each file should have objects that are close together. Uh, and then you want to ensure similarly sized partitions um, files because if you want to balance computation over many nodes, you don't want the, the, the node that, that's unfortunate enough to be processing the Galactic Center to be you know, spending, to have a file that's 100 times larger than, than the, the node that, that's processing um, the, the node not be full. Uh, and the solution that we came up with is something we're calling hip scabs. Uh, this is hierarchical heel fix partitioning. It is very simple. You, you take the sky, you partition it in heel fix, um, you partition it at a very high level. A very high order, so it's below end side. Um, you look at what the size of each file would be at that at that order. If the the size of a file is smaller than at some threshold, and you know, good thresholds are in order of maybe two hundred fifty six megabytes to a gigabyte for each file, you save that file. If the size is larger than that, you go and take that pixel and split it into to one order below, into into four subpixels. You repeat the same story about for those subpixels. If you have to continue further, you continue further. And you generate this, this tree of heel pixels of, with variable depths that by the time you're done, your files are guaranteed to be within about a factor of four in terms of size. And so here, what I'm showing you is uh, the guy, the R2 catalog, these are counts. And then here I'm showing you um, the heel pix order so n side is equal to two to the power of order. Um, Helix order or the, the partition sizes uh, that, 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 that part of the catalog got stored in. And what you're seeing is towards the North Galactic Pole, this is, these are large pixels of order two, you can see their size. And then you start getting into the galactic center and individual pixel sizes on the sky become smaller and smaller, but the file sizes are always roughly the same. And then on disk, that looks like something like this. It's a directory structure that's very easy to traverse. It's very easy to figure out which part of the sky maps to which, um, to which file. 
And the reason why we call this HIPS gap is that there's a, a VO standard called HIPS that's mainly oriented towards images that essentially came up with this kind of structure for images, but they didn't do the, they did the hierarchy, but they did the hierarchy differently. They used the hierarchy to basically bend the images in different, different levels. We're using the hierarchy to split the files, to split the partitions in different levels. Uh, so this is really the, 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 the extension of the HIPS standard. And because of that, a lot of the tools that we've written for HIPS should, should work on this as well. Um, so you get a ton so of- Is that being accepted by Ruben? We're, we're, um, we're trying to get that done by, we need to demonstrate that it works. So we're, we're trying to, by the end of this year, that's, that's our aim. Um, and that's how they would distribute. Yeah. So, so if, if I, I'm fairly, you know, my level of confidence is fairly high that this will be accepted. And then this is how the data get this exported for bulk downloads. And then you can imagine you can just, you know, rsync or whatever fancy tool you use to, to move data over or even buy hard drives in a backpack. <laughs> uh, you, you get it this way. But the nice thing is, I'm going to argue for almost for I think all of the use cases that I've seen this morning, you don't need to repartition anymore because I think you can use you can work directly off of this kind of format. Um, so this this checks off the three things that I um, that I already said were desired. Um, but if you look at these uh, uh, things four, five, and six, it 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 reuses HIP standard very significantly and, and a lot of HIP tools. So for example, Aladdin Light already knows how to read, how to construct HIPS paths and how to read HIPS data. So you could easily imagine modifying Aladdin to read these catalogs to go and overplot from files, to go and overplot the, the objects. Um, and it works over HTTP only interface, which means it works with S3. You don't need to have a server in front of this to actually serve it other than HTTP. Um, and, but the, the biggest, I think, the most interesting thing to me is um, if you partition the catalog this way, you enable distributed catalog to catalog joining and cross matching. Because if you imagine now two catalogs that are partitioned like this, and you say, I need to join you know, an object, let me see what's going on. I, I need to join you know, objects in this region with the objects in the same region that are catalog. It's very easy to compute what's the file that contains this region here and this region there. You download those files together. You do your cross-matching with whatever algorithm you prefer for cross-matching, and you're done. And you can do this in parallel uh, because all of these partitions are, are designed so that you can take each partition from both catalogs. Uh, the hierarchy, and they'll take me a, lot, a bit longer to explain, but uh, you can have different hierarchies some, because some catalogs may be shallow and will have everything at a Helix order of two or three. Others may be deep. It works out. You have to trust me or you have to ask me after the talk. But, and it, it guarantees, the scheme guarantees that the size that the CPU has to deal with would always be not more than a few times the size of individual partition. So then somebody mentioned in the morning that they had a problem where you know, the, the computer blew up because there was too many, too much data that got pulled into RAM. These kinds of schemes allow you to actually know in advance how much data you're going to get and to control that with a threshold. So it's it's quite nice. Um, you can do both pre-computed and dynamic joining. And dynamic is the one that I love because you can basically, um, anyone can stick a catalog in the cloud like the this. Cloud. Yeah. Anyone can stick a catalog in the cloud like this. And if you just have a URL to that catalog, you can go and cross match against it. So you don't have to treat every catalog as a special snowflake uh, for, for most cases. For some cases, you do. And so, yeah, this is, this is kind of the example of that. Because you can pick any two catalogs and decide to do this kind of a join, um, and you can do it in parallel. Um, so the fact that you can do it doesn't mean that you do it without tools. This is where, where tools come in. We talked a little bit about this this morning. Um, uh, here is some um, pseudocode of, of how this works. Um, you could, for example, point to, and this is being Python, uh, you can point to a table uh, on S3 that contains Euclid and another one that contains LSST. You can select just a small piece. You can then cross-match, say Euclid to LSST. You can filter by 
running a Python function called select dropouts here over each object. Everything happens in parallel, and then you can save the results as a table. Um, we've we built a prototype on this uh, of something like this on Spark uh, a couple of years ago. Um, here's a this is a slide that I've shown you um, yesterday. Uh, sorry, yesterday this morning. Good morning. But, um, <laughs> It's, it's before lunch, so it feels like yesterday. Um, and and the, the point here to show is that these APIs look very similar to pandas. Uh, we should be able to explain them to a typical astronomer. And nowhere here do I talk about spinning up a big cluster. How many nodes am I using? How many cores am I using? All of that stuff that, that's very confusing and difficult. All of that is handled by, by the framework uh, underneath. And, and this is nothing revolutionary. These are all tools that the people in the industry have been using for years now. So I'm not proposing some magical thing that we're going to write. Um, this is how it's, how it's done. Um, now, <clears throat> with Sparks, we've, we've done uh, a lot of, Spark, we've done a lot of experiments. We've done searches for these Boyajian type stars that, that have dips um, with ZTF data. Um, this, all this works. Um, it scales very nicely. So here's an example of, of auto scaling, uh, where on the left, what you see is we, we run a Spark query um, and, and the Spark notices that the query is, looks at the, the watch and goes, oh, the query is still going. I'm just gonna ask for more CPUs and then doubles the number of CPUs. And then looks at the watch, the query is still ongoing. I'm just gonna double the number of CPUs again. And it keeps doubling the number of CPUs until the query is done. So if you think about what this means, it means that any query, assuming you know, infinite computational power or infinite credit card, um, any query finishes in log n time. So you give it a, a query that's that's ten that's you know hundred times more complicated, it will run maybe ten times longer. If you're actually clever and do this algorithm more clever, it, it you can do it in constant time. Um, we, we find some challenges with access uh, with, with Spark. Mainly the problem is Spark is written in Scala. Very few astronomers know Scala, and it's it's a it's a huge barrier to entry. So so now we're we're writing essentially an equivalent using Dask, which is a Python uh, um, analytic solution, and and we're calling it the the uh, large uh, survey database. And we we have um, I can show you Jupyter notebooks with with internal alphas, but something that's broadly useful. We're targeting the IVA meeting in May. Uh, so in Bologna, there's an IVA meeting, and we'll have prototypes running because we need to start familiarizing this uh, with the IVA. Um, okay, so um, as, as usual, I talked way longer than I expected. Um, so I will, I'll, I'll give you maybe a, a two-minute feel of of um, of my last um, uh, piece, which is Jupiter Hub in the cloud. Um, and these rich analysis interfaces. So you want to be able to run these kinds of queries not from your laptop, but from, from some Jupyter that runs next to the data. Um, and um, our, when we say rich data uh, um, interface, we really mean Jupyter. Um, um, Jupyter, that's, that's what our science platform UI is. It's, it's, it's the thing today. Um, and, and now here's, here's the key thing. Um, how do you use Jupiter? I bet that if you look at this, you will, you will agree with all of this. What do you expect when you use Jupiter? I expect that my notebooks are long-lived. So when I write something on my laptop and then I go to lunch or you know, go to Chile and Brazil and then come back home, I expect that notebook to still work and not to have to restart it or discover that it died and so on and so on, because then it keeps interrupting my work and I get very annoyed and angry. Um, Two, I expect to have access to my files and scripts for my, for my notebook, so the things that I usually work with. Uh, I expect to be able to utilize all of their available memory, and if I run over, um, what happens on my laptop is if I, if I start using more memory than I have, then things slow down because it starts swapping, but things don't crash. So typically, I have enough time to notice, oh, crap, like I did something very silly, I'm using too much memory, I'm going to go back. And I expect to be able to utilize as much as CPU as I get. Um, and I prefer not to compete with CPU memory with other users. But ideally, if I have eight cores, I want to use my eight cores or my, my N cores. So this is basically quote unquote laptop experience or my own computer experience. And 
if I look at how these platforms work in the cloud today, it's very different from that. The typical implementation of Jupyter and Kubernetes, and the, the typical way we do it is we either oversubscribe a large machine or allocate one host per user, but we do things like to control cost. We usually terminate these notebooks within one hour of, of within some time period of inactivity. Default is one hour. So that means I'm working on something, I go to lunch, I come back, go uh, back so and now I have to restart my notebook. If you do that to your user, they won't be back. They'll be back with torches and pitchforks. Um, so two, um, if I run over my memory limits, it's hard termination. The way Kubernetes works, they won't let you swap. So swap files are uh-uh. So if you run over, boom, and you may have a notebook that you're where you're 100 cells down in your analysis, and now it just blew up on you, and you have to start back at square one. Again, user will be unhappy. Um, and then you, you're running through a notebook, and you discover that you've, you're running on a machine that has maybe four CPUs um, and, and or like 16 gigabytes of RAM, and you discover, oh, but actually I need 32. Um, you need to manually move your work to the, the next machine. So what that happen, what then happens is the first time that happens to you, you go, I'm never ever going to use that 16 gigabyte machine again. I'm just by default going to pick the largest one. And that's will always happen if you're not paying for it, which means that you're paying for it. Right. So from the point of view of the platform of the operator, you got two choices. You either have poor resource utilization, you let users run without timeouts with large memory machines. It will cost you a fortune if you're in the cloud, or if you're not in the cloud, it means that you're going to have fewer users that you can support. Uh, or you can give full user experience and your users are going to look like that. Um, and they will not come back to you, they'll not put up with that unless you're the only way to, um, to get to what they're trying to do. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll now jump over a lot of interesting things in between to, to basically say that we've solved this by by building something that we call checkpoint and restore for Jupyter platforms. We can take a container running your Jupyter um, and we can save it to disk. The whole thing, the memory, the open files, the everything, it's like hibernate on Windows. We can save the whole thing to disk. And when you come back and log back in, it gets restored from disk. And to you, it looks like this thing has been running all the time. And the neat thing is, once you have that, you can do all kinds of interesting things. Like we can also then, instead of saving directly to disk, we can just save that image and send it to the bigger node. We can restore it on the bigger node with more memory or more cores. So when you're in that situation where you discover, oh, I have too few cores or too, too little memory, you push a button, the whole thing migrates to another node you don't even notice. You suddenly just see that it's like hot plugging CPUs or memory. Um, and then it can go back as well. When you discover that you're you're using less than the node uh, gives you, you can move back to the to to the, to the smaller machine. And the best thing is actually you don't want the user to do that at all. You want to have a daemon in the background to be checking that and dynamically shifting them around. So then you get a user experience that looks like a laptop, but that is working only when the user is sitting at the at the machine. And we've we've done this code. There's a pre-recorded demo right there on that URL. And we ran LSSD code on this. And LSSD codes are like 5 million lines of code. We ran the whole stack in the blender just to show that it works. And you know, checkpointed in the middle of the running and restored it and everything, everything worked. Uh, so this kind of thing, I argue, is how you save costs in the cloud. Um, you can then do things like you can run on these things called spot instances on the cloud that are three times as cheaper, but Amazon can kill you anytime. It will, they'll give you one minute of warning. But now with one minute of warning, you really? can drain out and move elsewhere, right? So your user doesn't see this and you save three times as much money. And at this point, when you run these numbers, you actually start discovering that this costs less than a laptop for a typical user and how user uses it. So it starts becoming kind of as cheap as buying your user, you know, a, a decent laptop to work on this stuff. And they have all this flexibility of, you know, do I need a, a, a bigger node, a smaller node? Da, 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 da. And everything works in the cloud. So they can do things like, you know how in Google Docs, you have multiple users who can type on the same doc. So that enables you to do that as well. 
So I think this is the killer feature. If somebody implements this, I think this is, if, if I didn't have LSST to do this, I would take a two year leave of absence and go do a startup on this. I, I think there's at least Make 10 money. million. I think there's at least 10 million in this. Uh, I think this is like 10 million in revenue within two years. Yeah, let's uh, join. We'll yeah, get join no, back. seriously. Th this is like, if you think about what Google Docs did or what Overleaf did for, for LaTeX, right? Like this is insane because uh, like we think about Jupiter as, as astronomy, but all the data scientists out there are using Jupiter, people with actual money, uh, right? So anyways, if you want to do some interesting research in, in this space, I think this is the thing to go and and we just don't have people in time. Um, so I'd, I'd love to collaborate on this if, if you have ideas. Anyways, uh, I'm, I'm way over my time, uh, but, but this is how I'm gonna end. I think this is my prediction for the future. Um, We'll in, in you know, five years, three to five years from now, we'll be working mostly through web browsers. You'll be able to auto scale uh, like RAM and CPUs with these kinds of tools. Um, and, and you'll be able to, to, to run analysis like I've shown you within minutes, even if it runs on, on hundreds of terabytes. And we'll actually prefer that. And if you think that's crazy, think about today where I prefer to open Google Doc relative to Word. Uh, I prefer to open Overleaf relative to LaTeX. You told me that I was going that I would type LaTeX on a random website like just three years ago. I would tell you that that's that's insane, or maybe four years ago. Like, why would I do that and pay for it? Uh, and so I think this is where this is where we're going, and we have a huge opportunity to make this happen and make you know, LSST useful and and all these other data sets that are coming. So sorry about running over time. Well, that's your right. Mind boggling. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so let's let's build it. Oh, this is sorry. This is really my last slide. This is not just idle talk. We're we're working with um, um, space telescopes, IPAC, and PSARC, um, and and Ruben clearly to to build this. So they are working on NASA Science Platform. We've come together to work on the formats. Each one of us has picked one data set that we're importing in this format. And we're going to put it in the cloud. So this is really happening. And I would love to get um, um, uh, collaboration with started with, with you guys here. So something that you have in Brazil that's unique, we can add to, to this uh, new world of, of, of things working in standardized data sets and you know, make a strong impact. No, well, let me remind that we have an agreement, collaboration agreement with DIRAC. That's so exactly. It's already signed. It's just a, a matter of having ideas in time. Okay, well, let's thank uh, Dr. Yurich again for this very interesting talk. Uh, we have now some time for questions. If you join us on Zoom, please raise your hand and ask a are question. Are we monitoring the YouTube? Yes, and if you are with us on YouTube, please put your questions in the comment section and we'll read it out loud. And if you're with us, feel free to ask your questions. Uh, questions. We have so many questions already. I had no that, that, that was the hope. <laughs> well, I, I think the problem, I mean, after listening to that, I feel guilty of buying any hardware. Um, but the problem is, it's not easy to get just by money for the cloud. It's the kind of money that's hard to get. People like to break champagne. They don't like to see something that's puffy, puffy like a cloud. So. How, how this has changed in the States. I mean, clearly as if it's, uh, has bought, uh, they have bought the idea. I, I, I think um, a, a lot of things have, so some things have been top down. So NASA has top down said, our missions are going to use the cloud. You may have issues with that, but just, you know, try it. Uh, and, um, and and they're they're working towards that. Uh, I think that there's what what people typically worry at, at archives is does this mean we're going to lose people? And and I think if you reassure them that the answer is no, uh, that in fact you're you're going to get more people in areas where your core competency is. I think they're fine with it. And what I mean is. Right now, you're, you're maintaining a data center. And that's not something that, that um, you know, let's say at, at Space Telescope, that Space Telescope is known for. What Space Telescope is known for is are extremely competent people writing these pipelines and understanding the data that are coming off of, you know, off a web, telescope, web space telescope or a Hubble 
Uh, and you want more of those to support your users. So if you lose the hardware, it's true you're going to um, um, you know, not, not have those, those positions to really maintain the hardware, but those positions are now would now move into user support because, because you put in something like this, you suddenly have many more users and you, you become a much more focused organization. You start thinking about, you don't have to think about um, you know, my, I had this example of um, you don't have a you don't have a, a formula driver also build a car, right? If you give the car to the engineers who know how to build it and you focus on driving, and that's the same thing I think once this archive when the once the archives realize that that's kind of where it's going that they really don't care about running around and swapping failed hard drives all the time, they're fine with it. The biggest about, problem is cost. Uh, what about in, in our land, Strasbourg, I mean, all these places? Are they ready to go? Different right. places think about this differently. I think in the US, um, US is oriented more towards trying to figure out how commercial clouds will, will work. I think Europe and Canada are, are more uh, oriented towards making their own academic clouds. Um, and that's that's kind of where I see things going there. But uh, the concepts are the same. It's, it's like, how do you effectively Allocate data. Um, well, in Europe, if I, I'm not mistaken, they join astronomy and particle physics, right? Or what yeah. was the name? What is the name of the problem? They, there was an asterisk and there was escape, and I, I forget which escape, one is which. Escape, yeah. escape, escape, escape. It's asterisk, I think it's the, the Dutch, and the, the other ones. But, but it's, uh, I, I think that the concept is just um, more about. Um, Let's start thinking about how to use industry standard tools um, and formats. Like we use Parquet on, on the bottom of this HIPS structure. Um, so it's actually the HIPS, HIPS, HIPS cap file is a completely legal partition Parquet file. If you give it to a data scientist who knows nothing about astronomy, he'll recognize, okay, recognize it as a as It's a, just a partition. Uh, yeah. So, but it also happens to be, have semantic meaning to an astronomer. Um, so, and, and you can implement that either in your own data center, but it, it becomes more powerful if you, you run it on you know, some shared infrastructure because you can then start joining. So who is uh, paying the NSF so that pays for the US data facility? Uh, yes, uh, I think I, it's a combination of NSF and DOE, I don't know. DOE is still paying for that. And they both are good with that. Yeah, okay. Right. They they just signed the signed the agreement. It, it just solves so many problems because you don't. So, but the data reduction is still going to be on prem. Data reduction is still on prem, and and I think that that makes perfect sense because <laughs> for data reduction, you you have a large chunk of of data that are like images and and like temporary um, um, products that will be quite expensive to keep in the cloud, and you can project. How, how much hardware you need to buy. So it sort of makes sense to do it on, on cloud. So then you're gonna get the catalog and the catalog <laughs> of the cloud and go all the operation of exploring and processing. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah, the catalog will be in the cloud, all the user user access and so on will be in the cloud. How it's gonna be regulated? Because you know, whoever has, I mean, will, will they impose a limit? I mean, you have a, a 2,500 researchers, right? Worldwide. Yeah. So are you gonna provide the processing for the 2,500 people? I, I don't know how the limits are gonna impose, but I know they will be imposed. Uh, there's gonna to have to be some quota otherwise. So what I understand is that you're gonna to have to apply for computer time instead of telescope time. Yeah, I think that there'll be some default um, 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 allocation. Okay. Yeah. And then for something bigger, you're gonna to have to apply. So from the user's point of view, this will be the feeling will be the same as if you're in, in the building, except that, oh, there's such a variety of nodes I can choose from. And maybe, oh, look, there's a Euclid data set there, and there's a Roman data set there. And so the users but will going to have some kind of authentication authorization. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. that's, yeah. But the, the nice thing is in the cloud, um, all these data sets will also be accessible through S3 APIs. So um, there will have to be some authentication because, because they're proprietary only for data rights holders. But if, let's say I, I apply for that, uh, for that time with Ruben and, and they say no, 
And but I go and convince someone, but I go and then apply for an NSF grant, and the NSF and that panel says yes. So I don't ordinarily I would be blocked by the Rubin decision, but here if the NSF panel funded you know, hundred thousand dollars of credits, I can just go and do it. And that's the beauty of this. How about the index in that context? How how would that work? I mean, what would be the contributor? Maybe a, a part of the cloud. And I understand geographic going ge across the, uh, geographic bar borders is actually complicated. Yes, yeah. so there are many issues here that I glossed over. So, for example, what do you do if NASA parks everything in AWS and NSA parks everything in Google? Like that costs money to to to, to exchange data. But okay. you could argue that. That's a question of critical mass. If you get to a point where the NSF as, a, as an organization is buying credit, the NASA is buying credits, I'm sure they can come up with an agreement with both Google and Amazon to allow uh, cross-border cross traffic with no taxes. Um, but so you, you got to get and reach that scale. Um, for, for the IDAX, um, I think that's a good question for the for the workshop. Like how, how do IDAX work once the, the Everything's in all right. That have a discussion section. So. Yeah, <laughs> but it's uh, but I think you know, one answer might be uh, nothing changes because what you as an IDEC provide, at least in my mind, is is both computing and here there are going to be limits on computing, but but it's unique services that are I think it's really services. Interesting. Yeah, it's like the you know the, the producing um, the um, uh, photo Z catalogs. Or you know the uh, maybe the, the occultation service, like that's why you go to these places. That's why you go to different websites because they they provide the service, service that you can have elsewhere, and and you can even provide it in such a way that it's I log into the Ruben Science platform on Ruben, but from that Jupyter notebook I'm hitting your service, right? So. I don't even log on to your Jupyter part, but maybe I'm hitting the API to get the um, the predict to get the the, the, the photo Z's or the predictions. So I, I don't think we even know all the different ways people will mesh this together. Um, well, it's good. It's good to have options. It's confusing. <laughs> it's good. I'm getting confusing. older. Than... <laughs> there are options. There are options. I have one question. How did you implement the, this kind of snapshot work? I'm a good idea. So here's the question. Are there people on Zoom who need to, to leave soon? Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, they, they have questions. Yeah, they can leave. Right? We can tell later. Uh, yeah. This is one of the questions. Well, we, have, we have plenty of time. Okay. Okay. So Actually, tomorrow, we're going one one, uh, we to provide one hour for people to join us. Here, so from the you know other members of the Brazilian participation group or um, associated to Dania to actually join us. Okay, so I think Yeah, I have a question about the the hip scat. Uh -huh. uh, you can, mentioned. Can, can I answer first this one? I'm sorry. Sure, I, I sure, didn't, sure. Uh, and, and then I'll, sorry, I'll... I, I thought it, it oh. was going to. Uh, uh, off the record, yeah. Be off the record. Oh no, no. I, I just, uh, I, I just, I just wanted to make sure that that uh, there aren't people online who have to go and are waiting for, uh, for a question because, because this might, uh, this might take five minutes. So waiting for any question from the. No. Okay. So, so here's, here's the technology. Um, um, so we use something called. Uh, CRIU, and it stands for Checkpoint Restore in User Space. And, and CRIU is this amazing tool that uh, can, can freeze a running process. Uh, and like in, in Linux, it will attach to a running process and it will download all of its memory. Then it will download all the open file descriptors, including PCP. So you can actually migrate PCP connections, which is just Insane. Yeah. Um, and store it to disk, and then it can do that in reverse. And it started in as like 20, 2011 by OpenBZ folks. Does anyone remember OpenBZ? Um, it's like early containers. This is before containers no. were a thing. Uh, and and it's been in the kernel since too young for this. <laughs> <laughs> it's been in the kernel since 2013. So this is not some obscure thing that popped up yesterday that doesn't work. Right, like this has been um, um, there for quite some time, 
And it's been when it when it got in, it was it was marked as this uh, mad Russian thing. Uh, this is what Andrew Morton wrote, who's one of the the, the main kernel developers. Uh, this is project by various mad Russians to perform checkpoint restore mainly from user space with various oddball help of code, blah blah blah. Uh, I don't think it will work. Uh, it worked, and and so this is everything that it supports. So it it will take a process and it will save it and all of its children. So all the process IDs, user groups, authentication, all things that you didn't even know Linux had. I, I learned a lot researching this. Uh, all the application memory, open files, pipes, repos, Unix domain sockets, network sockets. How big is this? This, this entire it's it's in the kernel. You have it. Um, the, the 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 user space parts are like I don't know. Your megabytes? It, 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 it remembers me for the, the function, the function of the operation. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like on, on Windows, like your Hibernate thing is this. Yeah, yeah. um, and it, 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 it stores all of these things. And it can, it can do a snapshot in about uh, one to two seconds and restore in about one to two seconds. And it's this green bound. And so if you look at that video that I posted on, on, on like a demo of this, you'll notice that, that the snapshotting takes about 30 seconds. And the reason for that is the way it's implemented. Um, they, they snapshot and then they compress. They gzip compress the snapshot. And gzip compression happens in one core. So that those 20 seconds, 19 of them are, are zipping <laughs> of the file. And and when they wrote it, the person who wrote this code didn't provide a, a switch or something to turn off compression. So when I when I recompile the code by manually turning off compression, it's like poof, like two seconds down. Uh, so so it's 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 really neat. And the, the, the kinds of things that that you must worry about is it stores inodes. Um, and and that means that inodes are how Linux um, refers to files. Um, and and that means the file system must not change. It cannot just like copy this over to a different computer on a different file system that have different that where files may even have the same names, but their I know these numbers that are that you never see are going to be different. So this is where containers come in. Because containers are effectively little VMs. So and the return of file system is like everything that travels with, with a container. So you, you checkpoint the entire container. And then the reason how we got to the way how we got to this was I realized. You know, holy crap! We're we're running um, um, Jupiter Lab, Jupiter Hub in containers. So if I'm figure out how to snapshot a container, I know how to snapshot my 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 process, and then amazingly it worked. Like we we Stephen, like I wrote the prototype over the weekend, and then Stephen wrote a much better prototype over the next weekend. And like we had this, it was one of those things where we realized we can do this. We immediately submitted an abstract to ADAS like four months ago with having zero lines of code written. And then three weeks before ADAS realized we need to write this and then like wrote it in two weekends. This was not hard and that's good because it means that the technology is quite mature and with a little bit of time, you could, you could actually get it to, to run. And it's, it's integrated in, not in Docker, but in Podman. Uh, so I think Docker now has an integration as well with Kriu. Podman is Red Hat's uh, container manager. I've seen you use Red Hat, but I've seen CentOS and Rocky mentioned. Uh, so you have Podman. And so Podman, if you're running a container with Podman, you can just do Podman container checkpoints and run down and you're done. So all we have to do is add a couple of lines to Jupyter to essentially when we hit the stop button on Jupyter, that it doesn't stop the thing, but the checkpoints it. And then when we hit the start button on Jupyter, that it checks if there's a checkpoint and loads a checkpoint uh, for, for this demo. Uh, but and again, like this is so close to working that I'm like if, if LSST wasn't two years out, um, I'd I'd take like one year of leave and just work on this because like this can make make cloud like super um, um, cheap solution really like, cheaper than, than yeah it's about four hundred lines of Python code in the end like this this whole business um, so I can um, happy to share this this uh, this set of slides. Um, you can actually this can also work on in shared servers. So we in, in Dirac we have one machine with a terabyte of RAM. Uh, everyone works on it. The best fifty thousand dollars I ever spent. So how many users do you have active? 
perspective uh, about I don't know, like twenty every any any given time. Uh, like all of our graduate students, everything I do, I can throw this laptop out the window. I won't lose anything because everything. What about you from outside? I mean, Link Hub. Oh, okay. So Link Hub is Link Hub doesn't run this, um, and uh, because we did this as a prototype, uh, we have about a hundred. 110, 120 registered users, okay. mm -hmm. wow. uh, but but there are maybe um, like in any given week there are maybe 15 to 20 users. I mean, are those delegates? Uh, no, we just uh, we give it to anyone who asks. Um, we we try we try to do the opposite of what we do at Ruben. We try to make it quick and informal. So if you need an account, everyone here needs an account, send me a GitHub user. I want them to use our Yeah, <laughs> that's fine. Um, I have anyone wants to use any piece of technology from it, talk to me and we'll get it. And so it's, yeah, it's um, it's fun. Um, like this, I, I think this is this is kind of what I'm talking about. Like the industry has gotten us so close to to getting some of this stuff worked so well for astronomy, which is why I'm excited. Okay, that's the answer. Julia will have to credit Okay. Oh, yeah. So hips cat. Hips cat. Uh, you mentioned that you have uh, some file size threshold defined before doing the partitions to define uh, the helix resolution for the next uh, partition size. So, uh, what do you? What motivates this choice of threshold? So, if we have a copy of the yes and we would like to repartition using that hips cat. What do we, we need to consider to? Uh, it's it's memory per core. So the, the 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 easiest way to build tools on HipScat is where each core where a core works on a partition at a time, um, and so and the way it does it is to, to load the entire partition into memory and then do something whatever the user wants. So what you want is that each partition that the core can reliably expect to be able to load that partition without running out of memory. So you want that that size to be maybe a few times smaller than the typical amount of memory per core. Because when the when the core loads it, um, you know, pandas is inefficient, so it will use three times more memory than it actually needs. And then if you're doing cross-matching, you will load two partitions and cross-match. And then the user might do something that's a little bit memory intensive. So my guesstimate is if your memory per core is an order of four gigabytes, then good size may be you know, 256 megabytes or 500 megabytes, that kind of level. Uh, on the other side, on the other hand, but why don't you want to go to very small sizes? The smaller the size is, um, there, there's latency to accessing each file, especially if you have them in cloud storage. Um, there, this is what's called time to first byte. So the more files you have, the more time you're going to spend waiting for that first byte. So you want the as, as large of a file size as possible. Um, the other reason is it compresses better and like everything is faster the larger the file. So you, it's like those are the constraints. And if Ruby is going to distribute this catalog already with some predefined partition. So do we need to know that in advance to plan our how do based on that? So, you mean uh, partition size? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> oh, can we redefine on the fly? Like, hips the image, or we. All right. So, so I, I've been thinking about it. And in principle, you could, because it, it, it all depends on the tool. If, if the tool is smart enough to say, oh, this, is, this file is a gigabyte in size, and I only have two gigabytes per core, I'm going to read this file as four pieces and 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 basically dynamically um, subdivided. And I think there's a way to implement that. We just, I don't think we're going to have that in the first version of, of LSDB because uh, it, it requires a little bit extra cleverness on how, how to do it. So, so I don't think it's fatal, but it, it may um, it, it it makes the tool a little bit more com complex um, to, to, to write. Um, and and but I think it's um, I think it's it's good to aim for it seems like the sweet spot is somewhere around like two to four gigabytes per core because Ruben's internal tools require four gigabytes per core if you want to run pipelines. So if you aim at four gigs per core with like uh, five twelve gigs of um, of memory per 
of 512 so megabytes um, per partition. I think that's that's good enough. Okay. Well, um, I think that's all for your questions. Let me just remind you all that this presentation will be available on our website and on Lina's, Lina's YouTube channel. Thank you everyone uh, for attending and a special thanks to Dr. Yurich. And everyone have a great day. Uh, stay safe and I hope to see you all again in our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So when I, when I ask questions about what your uh, what your size of your clusters is, um, um, 